Okay, we do have quorum, so good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome back. Uh, we'll just we'll get right into it. Um, could I get a mover for the consent items moved by Councillor Galloway Sealock? Uh, sorry, Councillor Inetis. Oh, okay, sorry. Councillor Gazola, do you have a question or the consent? Certainly. I get, I, maybe these are the first questions to do with the REAP. Um, I'm curious as to why they've changed the fiscal year, fiscal year end. It does it makes it difficult in, in reviewing their budget and that for comparative purposes. Um, the other, I couldn't understand why uh, the bulk of their monies come from municipalities who are on a calendar year end and why they've changed to a, to a March fiscal year end, which is the same as the senior governments who are giving them less and less money. So that's a question that I'll leave. Uh, another question, I, I, I ask this all the time, <coughs> where uh, the city of Waterloo and the rural, our four rural municipalities are, they don't seem to be uh, contributing. So. Okay. I'll leave that. Uh, does this come back to council next week? I, I don't. It, it would come back to council. Yeah, they could think about that. Uh, I have a question on item number two. Yeah, go ahead. I wonder who who executes these agreements now, and I I, I don't understand the need to change what we're doing now. Uh, there was sort of an explanation that you, we can get started earlier. Uh, we can get started earlier even if we continue with whoever uh, executes the agreements now. Okay, uh, Mr. Wilmer. Thank you, Chair Davey. So uh, there's really two categories of, um, of, of festivals or events. So right now for Big Music Fest, because it was a first time event in 2014, uh, the mayor and clerk executed the agreement based on council's authorizing of the, of the particulars. For other festivals and events, large recurring ones like Rib Fest or Blues Fest, and start if with council agrees with this recommendation going forward, Big Music Fest, staff authorized the agreement based on the, the one-time authorization that's recommended here. Okay, Councilor Gazzola, any further questions? Yeah, uh, on item number three, I don't understand what's what's happening here. It's to do with using our facility for some programs of the region. Uh, why is it why is it here? Why do, isn't it a, just a normal rental agreement? We don't we have no jurisdiction over the program. Uh, I, I'm not sure why why it's coming through here. Okay. Sure. Good morning. Oh, it, oh, would, sorry. it would normally be a normal agreement, and it's actually the region of Waterloo that requested that it's an agreement of that sort. In terms of why it's happening at the community center, it just uh, it's them that approached us, and it made good sense in terms of the programs and services that we're already providing, and that it was a good location from their perspective to have this kind of program in our center. I have no concern that it's being held at, at the community center. It's an appropriate place for it to be held. But why, why do we, do we, does this, do we approve all of the rental agreements that we get into? No, to my knowledge, the reason why this one is coming forward is because the agreement that the region has presented us with is a little bit more formal and so it required us to come to council. Otherwise, you're correct, it is usually just a, a regular rental well, contract. Well, you say it's a little more formal, I don't understand what, what what we're driving at. From my, from my, yeah, it's not the standard form. So again, it's, um, it's quite a bit longer agreement. And so it was just requested that it come forward. <laughs> okay. Are there any, because it's different, are there any trick items in it or what? No, there's no trick items at all. Okay. Okay, and then I, I just, I have a, a, a item number four. What's item number four? That's a uh, discussion. 
So that'll be coming up next. Oh, sorry. I'm right. done. Thank you. You're getting ahead of us. Uh, Councillor Glenn Graham. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Uh, I'm just wanting to, uh, I guess there's no one here from REAP, is there? Is there? Okay, terrific. Um, I, I had a question about um, the 27,500, how many years we've been providing that. It says over 14 years we've increased our, our amount, but uh, can we get a sense of, I think during my term, it's uh, this term of council, it's been 27,500 every year. Is that correct? It was in the report. I'm not sure which page it was on. I missed that. I, I know it's been over 14 years. It says it's been a certain amount, but yeah, I, I don't have the the enough history and background. I've been with Reek for 15 months now, so right. um, I can get that information back and circle yeah, back to council. Yeah, just to, uh, to give a heads up, I, I think I'd be interested in um, certainly adjusting that to uh, because if we've been holding firm on that. I think it's reasonable to to bump that up, um, certainly to the rate of inflation, and um, I would propose an increase. Uh, my motion would propose to 30,000, and in future years, funding be increased at the rate of inflation, the CPI. So if you could help us understand, Dave, um, when you come back, what the percentage increase of your expenses has been uh, over the period that you've received 20. 7,500, that would be helpful uh, because, uh, and how many years you've received that amount. Okay, I that, can, that I can do that. Great. Excellent, thank you very much. And, and, and I just, just for, I did note Councillor Gazzola's questions and we'll, we'll respond with those ones as well. Again, I don't understand, I don't know the answer to the questions at this point in time. Okay, certainly, and sir, could you state your name for the- uh, My official? name is Dave Blake, I'm the Business Development Manager at Reap Green Solutions. Perfect, okay. Thank you kindly. Uh, Councillor Glenn Graham, before I let you go, I just want to make sure I understood. So your intention isn't to bring any motion forward now. If you're going to, you bring it forward at Council. Or I, I mean, I can bring it forward to now or later. It doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, I can give notice of motion now. Okay. That, uh, that's my intention. Okay. Um, so yeah, so is your intention to bring it forward at, at now? Council. I, I guess the only concern to you, and I guess you have to look to staff, is that this is coming out of the um, Environmental Committee's budget. So this would be over and above, so we need a funding source, presumably for the recommendation or for the motion, but we'll, let's just get through the rest of the questions and we'll come back, okay? Sure. Um, Councillor Fernandez. Uh, yes, thank you. My question is on the uh, Big Music Fest agreement. Um, <clears throat> can I and help me understand how many years some of the other festivals that we have, um, for example, the Koi and the Blues, um, Multicultural, how many years did those festivals run before they were um, given delegated authority? Or were they given delegated authority immediately upon the first year that they were uh, in effect? Mr. Gear? I can't answer that question precisely. I'd have to go back to the records for, for that because most of those festivals have been running for, uh, for over 10 years now um, since I've uh, been to the uh, working with the city. but. Uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if most of them have been running with uh, delegated authority from the beginning. Um, most of those festivals have grown uh, incrementally over the years. Um, so Blues started off as a festival of 1,500 folks about uh, 13 years ago. And uh, my guess is that most of them, as a result, have always worked within the, the delegated authority. Having a delegated authority, how does that include the ward councillor for decisions regarding a festival like this because it's um, <clears throat> this is the first year the other festivals are affect the downtown and the downtown councillors but this is a bit of a unique situation so how does the ward councillor get involved in the process you'll recall last year uh, or earlier this year we uh, we outlined a set of guidelines for launching new events and uh, and involvement of the ward councillor and and council was uh, critical to that process um, we we outlined a process of community engagement in the in uh, launching new events in new locations so essentially that framework those set of guidelines uh, provide the framework for staff delegation in this particular case Okay, thanks for reminding me about that. Um, just a quick comment. I, I would like to see this festival um, go at least one more year before we go into a delegated authority situation. Okay. Councillor Rabinovich. Thanks. <clears throat> um, 
I guess a question and a comment. Just so that I understand the situation with, with REAP accurately, REAP's request was 27500 of the city, and the recommendation is that we give them the amount that they requested? Or did they request more and it's a reduced amount? Mr. Chapman? Through you, Chair Davey, I draw your attention to the letter on 1-4. This is REAP's request to the Environmental Committee. Their request was for $27,500 in 2015. Okay. Um, and, I, and I only ask that question because, I mean, I've been a, a, a big supporter of REAP from, from day one, but it's not usual for us as a council to be, to be suggesting giving a group more money than, than they've asked for. Um, I certainly know that if, I mean, it's certainly be amenable to, to looking at a different number if, um, if in fact they requested more and staff or the committee's recommendation was less. But to go and give more than they asked for would certainly be, I think, a bit out of the norm in terms of how we normally handle things uh, around the horseshoe. Um, so I, I just raise that as, as something to, uh, to consider. The, <clears throat> the second... Um, issue is uh, with respect to uh, Big Music Fest. I think um, with respect to the, uh, the agreements, um, it's always trying to find that right balance between our role as, from a governance perspective versus staff's role from a, a management perspective. And I think what's proposed here is consistent with how we handle uh, other events from a, a management perspective. If in fact there's issues, you know what, there won't be anything stopping council in the future from uh, dealing with it. And I would expect that staff would continue to work with the ward councillor and the neighbourhood, uh, regardless of what the delegation of authority uh, is with respect to an agreement, uh, just as part of uh, the, the ongoing operations of a festival, as we continue, as we work with the Victoria Park Neighbourhood Association uh, and others on uh, festivals that are in the downtown. So that would be my, uh, my thought on that. Okay. Um... Yeah, we'll just, again, if we could just stick to questions until we get through. Uh, Councillor Singh. Um, yes, and appreciate some of the questions that have already been asked by Councillor Fernandez for uh, Big Music Fest. I had some of the same concerns. Um, so uh, I was looking to compare with the other, other music festivals that we have in the city as to when that transfers, as to council discussion to delegated authority. Um, so I just want to get a confirmation from staff one more time. It's, it's fair to say that this is not a atypical type of event. This is quite still unique and different uh, in comparison to the, uh, I guess, the size and type of an event that happens in the city. Mr. Here. Yeah. Uh, through you, Chair Davey. Uh, as Councillor Vanovich has already said, um, we have a very close working relationship with the Victoria Park uh, Working Group regarding the events that are hosted there. We certainly work with uh, the ward councillor and with, uh, with um, uh, stakeholders who, to make you know, strategic adjustments to those events, uh, the ones that take place in Victoria Park. So we see that as a natural process of uh, communications with, uh, with the ward councillor and the community as a whole uh, in managing um, events as they evolve. <laughs> Mr. Gear, thank you for answering uh, Councillor Fernandez, oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Ravenovich's comment, but I was saying, uh, my question was, is it fair to say this is not a, a, uh, this is not a typical event that happens in the city? It, 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 it in itself is still considered to be unique as to the size and the components that are uh, associated to it, the, you know, the, the extensive uh, planning that takes into account with city involvement in planning for it because the size of the event. That was my question. Right. Well, um, yeah, I think the, the, I think the big difference between the big music festival and, and the other events that happened, particularly in the downtown, was that it, ha it, it grew to size in one year. It was the first, the first year was a large event, and, uh, and more typically our events evolved from small to large events uh, over the period of time, right? So, um, uh, you know, we feel that we've got a good uh, framework in place to guide uh, the evolution of these events. Uh, we, we've... Um, uh, you know, we value the contribution and the, the input of, the, of not only the community and the ward councillor, but other stakeholders as well in the 
development of, of this event further. I'm not sure what the additional capacity of uh, McClellan Park is, but um, you know, it wouldn't, uh, because it was so large the very first event, it may not have that much growth uh, potential uh, beyond what we've already seen. Um, whereas, clearly, when we started Blues, it was a small event of 1,500 or 2,000 people, and now it's 160,000, so. Okay. Uh, thank you for your, so, your answer. Second, Mr. Mr. Wilmer, do you want to add a comment? Or? Thank you, Chair Davey. We do recognize that this is uh, distinctly different from other special events and festivals, and for that reason, whereas other, other recurring festivals, the uh, delegated authority is delegated to the manager of special events, in this case, the recommendation is that it be delegated to the CAO. So in that way, we are recognizing that it's different. But I would remind Council that, that you did put your mind to this issue of new festivals, events, new locations in August, September of this year and adopted an approach. And this recommendation is consistent with the approach that you recommended or that you approved just two months ago. Mr. Wilmer, that approach uh, laid out the framework that it would be delegated authority after the first year to staff? That's right. Did it... Uh, did it I, Yes, so with, that with it, this, it, today's decision is necessary though, so it wasn't a blanket approval in September. It was saying that for a first year event, we will confer with the community and, and council will review and authorize the agreement. For the second and ongoing, once there is council authorization, then it would be a delegated authority to, to uh, authorize the agreement. I'll have to refer back to that report, but uh, I, again, I'll uh, refrain from further comments and uh, take that opportunity when the time is right. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, there are no further questions, so I would actually look back to um, Councillor Glenn Graham for comment on the REAP. Thank you. Uh, we don't have enough information to make an informed decision, so I'm asking, I'm giving notice of motion that, that my intention is that because I know that expenses go up, and certainly I would expect that, would, at least at the rate of inflation, that uh, it would be worthwhile to consider with the information provided by REAP um, an adjustment that at least the rate of inflation and perhaps a bump at this point. I understand they haven't asked for it, but that's not to say that they wouldn't benefit from it and it's, not, it's a modest increase. So um, that's my intention at this point is to wait until Council and to consider the information from REAP at that point. Thank you. I think it's, I think it's certainly appropriate to wait until Council and get the information back. I appreciate that. Uh, no other comments? Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my only comment would be that I wouldn't be supportive of uh, passing this along as a delegated authority to staff uh, as of yet. That is not to say that I think that's not the necessary step. Uh, it does have to happen. Um, I think it will come a point where the community will have accepted and absorbed as to what this event is and how it will continue to grow in the uh, McKenna Park neighborhood. Uh, but as I've said, this event is quite different than what we have in the city uh, as to the size, as to the uh, extent of planning that it takes into, uh, to, to put it together. This event uh, had its rocky beginning. Uh, it, uh, it was contentious in the, uh, in the community. Uh, it took time to get a consensus and uh, make sure that the necessary planning was put in place to ensure that people's concerns were taken into account into that planning capacity. And I have full confidence that staff will continue to take that same necessary steps and be mindful of uh, what the community wants and needs are. But at the end of the day, I think the community would still feel more comfortable if they feel that council had more involvement because our residents, our taxpayers, our citizens, their representatives are us. They feel more comfortable when they see the decisions are going through us or being vetted through us. That's not to say they don't trust staff. That's not to say that they don't, they don't uh, uh, have confidence in staff's ability. But as a, as a way of communication, they feel comfortable being able to relay their concerns directly to those that represent them. And I think it's still too early to pass this along to them. I think after next year, if it goes as well as it did last year, hopefully better, because it, there were still some improvements and changes that need to be made outside the event as well as inside that need to uh, take into account the considerable feedback that we received and that's why I think we need to ensure that council has the ability to have that dialogue engagement to make sure that we ensure that the necessary steps are taken to that, that uh, um, I guess I wouldn't say criticism but feedback that received from uh, the uh, last year is appropriately uh, accommodated and at that point once we can feel comfortable that the community has no major issues because there are still some, 
I think it would be fair to pass this along. But I think until after next year, this needs to still come before council so the community still feels comfortable coming before us as delegation and present their case if they have issues to make sure that those uh, issues are accommodated and adjusted into planning. So I will not support this. Uh, I, I'm not going to try to defer this. I don't know if that's a reasonable thing to do after the event, but I think it's fair to say it's, uh, it wouldn't be uh, right for us to uh, uh, approve the uh, recommendation as it sits. I'm just going to go to Mr. Wilmer for a moment here. Thank you, Chair Davey. And I realize this is the time for council comments, not staff input, so thank you for uh, allowing me. Uh, I just wanted to remind council that this type of event is a very competitive uh, business venture. From the city's perspective and from the neighborhood's perspective, it's essentially the same event as last year. The main difference is which acts, which talent are going to be booked. So for the promoter, they want to know that they'll have a date. They want to know that they'll have a festival on a certain date in a certain location so that they can nail down the acts and start marketing it. And the sooner they get to the starting line, the, the, the sooner we can help them to be successful. Uh, it's already November, and, if, if, uh, and you'll note that we've asked for this to be put on special counsel today because even a one-week uh, difference between uh, the authorization was a meaningful and uh, problematic difficulty for the promoter. And so I'm not sure that that was clear to council, but I think what, what may end up happening if, <clears throat> if council retains for itself the, uh, the authority to execute the agreement is the promoter will be in the same position that it was in last year, where it feels forced to go to market before the details are nailed down. We end up coming back to council after the fact. It's already public, and council quite rightly would say, what, what scope do we have to change anything here? With this, is, this is already out in public, and, and uh, you know, we don't really have much choice but to approve it. I don't think we want to be in that situation again. So I, I guess I come back to the fact that a festival or an event is only new once this was done. It was a hugely successful event. And for next year, it's basically the same event with different acts. Thank you. I, I appreciate the clarity. Uh, Councillor Singh, in fairness, I will go back to you if you had further comment. I appreciate that. And the reason why I wanted to, to make, make sure I say a comment afterwards, Mr. Wilmer, with full respect, the way you've outlined the argument uh, states or gives that impression the way we did it last time was not the right way of doing it. And I think we've tried our best to make sure the community doesn't take that impression. We did it based on a previous policy did not, which did not articulate or outline the necessity to go out in the public. And it's still, and that's clarified, and we've done that, and we have improved that policy. So to state it that it's going to place hurdles when it didn't last time, I think the event happened, it happened well, it happened fine, it can happen the same way again. That's my only response to those comments. Okay, we'll move along. There are now four people in the queue. Councillor gallery Seelock. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, with regards to Big Music Fest, is bring us back to what we're actually approving and that's an agreement. And at the end of the day, that doesn't mean that council doesn't have a say. It doesn't mean that we can't provide feedback. It doesn't mean that we can't provide input. And it doesn't mean that we can't engage the public. We still get to do all of that. This is just an agreement, as Mr. Wilmer said before he said it, um, I was planning on, it's about the location, it's about the date, and it, it's about those details, which we really don't need to provide input into. But as it moves forward, that planning, I think staff will be more than welcome to hear from, from us and from the community on what the input, the feedback, how we can do things better. I think staff have already, we've already vetted some of that through our previous discussions um, about this event. And I think that we really have to focus on what this is saying. It's not saying we can't have a voice. It's just about the actual contract and agreement moving forward. And I think that that's best left up to uh, staff to deal with. Um, so I, I, I say once again, we will still have an opportunity as council, as representatives of the community, to have a voice and help with the planning and moving forward uh, with this event. Thank you. Councillor Ioannidis. Yes, through you, Chair Davey. Um, I'm, I'm just not going to repeat some of the comments that were made. Um, just want to state basically that the event went really, really well. And uh, the community accepted it. Well, probably 99% of the comments that we have seen was in favor of, this, of, of, of the event and had a really great time. And you had about 13 to 15% of the sales of the tickets 
that are in the, that neighborhood, we, you know, that's pretty well overwhelming acceptance. We also, we also had a, a process that we put in place. We had the public, they made their consultation, and we made changes. And that's not going to change. All it's going to change is getting out of our hands so we don't have to get, create this red tape, this bureaucracy, for this event to go through. So I would encourage you all to support this for efficiency. Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, I came here today and I was going to reluctantly support that, that clause that were before us, but the more I hear, uh, the more I, I get upset about it. I, I don't understand this, this deal that uh, uh, council can't be brought up to date on what's happening, uh, that, they, that the promoter needs time. Uh, who's, he, who's the promoter competing with? Who's the promoter uh, dealing with? I, I don't understand all that. And I, I go back, and what really bothers me, I go back to last year that I knew nothing whatsoever about this until a, a late February or early March morning when I read it in the newspaper on a Saturday. And that, to me, is not, is not right. Uh, I, I can agree with... Uh, with Councillor Singh, can we not leave it for, for another year until we really get this in place? Do we have to be so quick to, to change uh, who has the authority? Because I don't see that by council dealing with it, we meet, we meet very often. How, how are we going to hold up th this whole event? So I, as of now, I will not be supporting it. And I, I gather we'll need to deal with that issue separately. We will. Mayor Zare. Thanks very much. Uh, I was going to stay out of the conversation, uh, but um, I'm compelled to make some comment. Uh, I think the way Councillor Galloway Sealock put it is, is absolutely correct. Uh, first of all, the process and the lengthy discussion we went through in September related to the pro uh, process for dealing with future events and the uh, debriefing of the current, uh, this year's event, uh, solved a lot of the issues that Councillor Singh has been talking about. There are still some to be dealt with. I would believe uh, that any of the issues related to parking, the advertisement, the notice to residents in the area, uh, the, the, the very fine detail is that's the kind of thing that we, will still be dealt with. But for those who uh, have uh, been on the centre and the square board, I think would have a, a good understanding, and there are several who have been, that the entertainment business is very, very dynamic. And it's a matter of, yes, sometimes days or hours in terms of making that final deal with the, uh, the entertainment. And uh, for uh, the ability to do that, I think is extremely important. And staff is able to respond, in, a, in the CAO in this case, would be able to respond uh, more efficiently for that. And uh, <clears throat> just to repeat, one aspect of Councillor galloway Sealock's comments, and that is that it, it will be and could be appropriate for council to weigh in on some of that after the fact. That's the how-to, it's not the what. This is about the what, making an agreement that the promoter knows that he has the place and he can go out and make the deal that he is trying to make. I had concerns too, but they've been, uh, th that's not what this is about. This is about making sure that the, the promoter knows he has the venue. So I will be supporting the, uh, the recommendation and call for a recorded vote. Thank you. Councillor Verbanovich. Thanks very much. Um, I will be supporting the, the recommendation. I think the only thing that I would be amenable to, to, to adding, and I'm not sure, I forget who actually moved it, it Councillor galloway Sealock moved it, um, would be to actually have a report come back um, after next year's festival. So, in other words, we, we're delegating now, but there will be a report that, that comes back. So that, I think, you know, would give some comfort and assurance 
um, around the opportunity for council to review after year two of the event. I think what's important to remember here is some of the comments that have been made uh, around <clears throat> around the role that, that council has versus the role that staff has. I think the other important thing to remember is that the person responsible for this is the single employee that council has. It's the CAO. So if we have issues and concerns along the way, we have someone that we can deal with and talk to, quite frankly, better than we did uh, un un under the old system. So in, in many respects, this is, this is an improvement. I think it makes sense for us to, to support this, to move forward, to allow the event to go forward, because in effect, if we don't, it means that the earliest that anything can be dealt with is essentially December the 8th unless something can be slapped together in the next few days in advance of council next Monday. And so I get the fact that the way the music industry works, you know, staff need to be able to work with the promoter on, on this issue. So I don't know if it's friendly or if you look for an amendment, but um, the only thing that I would suggest that we add is that a report come back uh, after the 2015 event uh, so that council can can review this before it goes forward further. Okay, thank you. So uh, I, I don't know. Is that that's fine? So that's okay. Uh, um, there are no further questions. I just have or comments. I just actually going to break the rules myself and ask a quick question, if I could. Um, the only regrettable instance, from my vantage, the only regrettable instance that happened here was that council the bulk of council was informed too late. So is there, um, implied in the recommendation, is there a way or can we get be assured that council will be notified of the event or relevant details of the event the moment that staff is aware? Through the chair, <clears throat> I'd like to say yes, but in, in the case where we're working with an external partner, we can't control what they say and when they say it. So we can give a best efforts on that and we can certainly tell you everything we know. But even in the case of the 2014 announcement, it happened before it was supposed to happen, and we didn't control that or know it was going to happen ourselves. Okay, that's fair. Okay, so we will take uh, the... We'll, we'll deal with that item actually first. So we're going to deal with item number two. Uh, as amended, or with the uh, added part from Councillor Rabanovich, which Councillor galloway Sealock has incorporated into the motion. So... Uh, those in favor of consent item number two. Re recorded vote's been called. Okay, the voting is open. Okay, those in favor? And opposed? That carries. Okay, and now we will vote on the balance items one and three of the consent items. Those in favor? Uh, and none are opposed. Okay, we'll move on to discussion item uh, number four, the uh, repeal and replacement of the dog bylaw. Ms. Shear. Good morning. I'd like to start by introducing Jamie Laflamme, who is the operations manager at the Kitchener Waterloo and North Waterloo Humane Society. He's here and available for questions if needed. Um, I'm really excited about this bylaw change. There's, we've worked together, legal, the Humane Society, enforcement, and the dog designation appeal committee members have also had the opportunity to comment on that portion of the bylaw and review it. What we have now is one very complicated and lengthy bylaw. And we've worked to separate it into two bylaws, one that deals with dog designations and one that deals with responsible dog ownership obligations. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the dog designation bylaw first. This bylaw is primarily concerned with public safety. The bylaw allows for dogs to be designated as potentially dangerous, dangerous, or prohibited. Often the instigating incident will be a bite or an attack either against an animal or a human. And the real purpose of the bylaw is to prevent incidences reoccurring. Once we know there's a danger with a dog, we want to address that and ensure that that dog is not given an opportunity to reoffend, if you will. 
how that's done, uh, designation is put in place. And council will be familiar with some of these designations because they're ratified before council. But conditions of the designation could include things like having the dog muzzled, containing it on its own property in a way that it can't escape, controlling the people that it interacts with, um, such as strange children visiting a house, those types of things. And it's all aimed at making sure that the public is kept safe. Now, the circumstances for these incidents vary greatly. Sometimes we'll be concerned about a dog only with other dogs, sometimes only with strange people, sometimes with all people. And what we've tried to do in this rewrite of the bylaw is to give the Humane Society more flexibility up front to ensure that this, the solution can be tailored for the particular dog. And what we're hoping is that when they're given more flexibility in the conditions that they apply, that the solution will be better for the situation and accordingly less likely to be appealed. And we think that could result in less work for the committee too if all goes well. Um, the report does outline most of the substantial changes to the dog designation bylaw. One that I did neglect to mention in the report is an expansion of the appeal period, or sorry, the time in which an appeal can be heard from the current 30 working days to 45 working days. This is to allow us a little more time to prepare witnesses, um, schedule a hearing on a day that witnesses can attend, meet with the dog owner and see if we're able to resolve things and provide the disclosure that we need to provide. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the responsible dog ownership bylaw. And the reason that we're coming to council today is because time is really important for this. We're trying to revamp the licensing situation and we would like to have that implemented for January 1st of next year. So the time is really important to us. We also want to make sure that we have our ticketing privileges back in place as soon as possible. We need to reapply in order to ticket when we have a new bylaw like this. I think with licensing, it's fair to say that the public does not love our current licensing system. However, licensing is an important source of funding for our animal services. For example, this year, we'll make a flat payment of $505,000 for all of our animal services but we get back about $209,000 from licensing. The additional licensing dollars pay for the cost of the animal services above that flat payment that we make. Currently, our licenses only last for the current calendar year. And the way that it works, it's sort of a graduated or progressive payment. So a typical license for a sterilized dog may cost $27 in January. That same license after March 31st costs $74, and it only lasts until December 31st. Needless to say, it makes it a hard sell for licenses in November or December. People get really upset when they're asked to pay more than double the original rate for a license that's only gonna last a few weeks. So what we've done is changed in the bylaw to a license that will last for 12 months. There'll still be an early purchase incentive, if you will, but even if you're paying the higher price, that license will still always last for 12 months. And we think this will really help the Humane Society to be able to sell these licenses throughout the whole year and to continue getting the licensing funding we need to support our animal services programs. Licenses are important because we want to return as many animals to their homes as possible. We want all dogs to be licensed. So we think that this licensing change also really furthers our goal of responsible pet ownership. The Humane Society would also, this isn't particularly addressed in the bylaw, but they are also hoping to pre-sell some 2015 licenses at the new rates that we'll be asking council to approve shortly. This will uh, allow them to start selling those higher value licenses, if you will, as soon as possible. The other changes I'm really excited about in the bylaw are the new dog welfare provisions. The changes allow cruelty issues for dogs to be addressed through our bylaw. This means instead of relying on one OSPCA inspector for the entire area, that the Humane Society officers can address some of these cruelty issues up front. And these are calls that council may be aware of complaints we get about dogs in cars on hot days. 
um, dogs without adequate shelter or not being taken care of properly. This allows all of the officers to go out and respond to those calls and be more responsive to the public concerns. Those are the changes that I wanted to highlight in particular for Council, but I'm happy to address questions on any of the other changes highlighted in the report. Thank you. There are some questions. Councillor Gazzola. I think you've done a good job on this. I, I, I don't have many problems with it. I, I am concerned with this necessity to get it approved all of a sudden. I mean, you, you've had a couple of years to work on it. Now we have to approve it within a week. Uh, my concern is, uh, has there been, we're, we're always talking about public engagement, has there been public engagement uh, with this? I notice, I know it's been posted on the, on our website and that, but not everybody has access to that. This is an area, this is an area, <laughs> refreshed my memory in campaigning, how many people have dogs there are a lot of dogs out there, a lot of people involved. Have we, has there been an opportunity for the public to see what, what you're uh, recommending here? I think what you're recommending is, is excellent in, in most of the cases. There's been no formal public consultation. What I can say is that all of the changes we have made are highly responsive to things that we hear from the public time and time again. And I, and I agree that, that they are, they're all good, but I still, you know, to give, there may be some other, some other opinions out there that we haven't considered. Why would we not have had a public meeting on this like we do for so many other things? Because I really believe this affects a lot of people. I, I guess... I, I would just throw out there as a possibility to not get hung up on this specific item. This is my understanding, correct me, staff can correct me if I'm wrong, this is a piece of a larger responsible pet ownership strategy and perhaps there will be opportunity when that full piece comes back uh, for, for some public engagement that won't hold up this, which staff will, which many of us would like to see in place in time for January 1st. Well, what is the harm if it doesn't get put in place January the 1st? What is the real harm? It, sure. It's... Uh, Especially when one of the major items is this this whole license uh, concept, which is the way I thought it should have always been, where you get a 12 or 24 month license. So I mean, we could put this into place on any date. There's no magic date in my mind that's required. For us, January 1st was the magic date in the sense that this is when all new licenses become due. So we wanted to get the benefit of the new pricing structure, the new license structure, and the new length of licenses as soon as we can, starting a calendar year so it lines up with the end of our old licenses. Um, and I would venture, and I wouldn't say this on many things, but I don't think you will get a single public complaint about a license lasting for 12 months. Well, I, I don't think so either, but I'm just saying they're, they're well, it, the, the report is a 37-page bylaw. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know how many members of council. Can I ask how many members of council read that bylaw? An honest answer. No. Okay, I, I, I asked for an honest answer. I really, I question the other thing. I question is why we had to print out 37 pages for something like that. Uh, to make sure we read it. Pardon? To make sure we read it. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't have any concerns. I, I don't own a dog. I just know I've been bitten by dogs. I'm, I'm knocking on doors. I, a lot of people own them, and I just, I think, there are, I think there are a number of changes here being made, excellent changes, but, you know, we, do we ever listen to the, to the public? This is one I think we should have. I believe that Shane had some comments on the public feedback as well. Mr. Turner? Through you, Mr. Chairman, and although it's not formal public engagement, uh, several members of council will know that I had a significant number of calls this year from the public with regard to 
dog licensing, uh, particularly when the, uh, the late fee went into effect. Um, and the city also, um, in working with the Humane Society, showed uh, a great deal of discretion in terms of uh, working with the members of the public regarding the late fee issue to the point that most of them were, were quite satisfied. Uh, but in my discussions, and I will say that they were significant discussions with members of the public, and we're talking about dog owners, when I spoke to them about the changes we were planning, before I even saw the, uh, the bylaw, but knowing that the bylaw was going to come forward as part of our, our strategy review, um, almost everybody, I would say almost 100% of the people that I spoke to uh, were in favor of the, um, of the 12 month period as opposed to the January to uh, December issue. Again, it's not formal uh, public consultation, but it was a significant amount of feedback. Okay, we're going to move along here. Councillor Verbenovich. Thank you. And <clears throat> I uh, want to thank uh, staff and uh, the Humane Society and our other partners for what I think is actually a, a well written document. It seems to have um, covered off a lot of the things that, that we've heard of over the last um, few years. Um, and also gives staff, the, I think, the tools necessary to do enforcement when, uh, when it's necessary uh, and also um, have some flexibility when that's key to address um, certain issues. The one thing that um, I just want to make sure, um, and in reading the document it appears to be the case, but I just want to be absolutely sure that there have been no changes to the provisions um, with respect to pit bulls. There was one minor, it was more of a grammatical change in the way we organized a couple of things, but no substantial change to any of the prohibitions on breeds. Okay, and, and it still allows for us to um, be slightly more generous than the provincial legislation, which we've, we've always been in that situation. Yes, our prohibited dogs don't include certain dogs that are AKC okay. recognized. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arnettis. Yes, thank you through Chair Davey. Um, overall, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with what's been put forward in particular. I really like the addition of the, well, the welfare of on how pets and how they're treated. Um, the one question I wanted to ask, and it's, it might be a little bit out of this, but during my campaigning in the last month or so, I've received probably about four phone calls about enforcement, and in particular from the Humane Society about going door to door and, and uh, and uh, asking for licensing fee. So I, I, you know, in their opinion, it looked like it was, you know, they're they're coming and knocking on doors and looking for cash, and it was more of a cash grab. And I, I want to know what what are we doing on our end to make sure that that perception or or what is the ex the way we enforce these things? Because I know usually through our through most of our other bylaws, we don't usually enforce our our bylaws unless unless someone has a complaint, so. I could address that. Um, I have worked with the Humane Society on the documentation they use, the letters. Um, I've seen the wording and think it's fair. I can say that they are being more aggressive in trying to get licensing. And part of that is the way that we structured our last contract. They kept our base rate the same going forward, so we had no increase in our costs, but they were able to do that by really working firmly on getting more people licensed. So we are benefiting from a more aggressive stance on licensing by keeping our animal services price flat. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't disagree that we're benefiting, but it, it's, it's those per, that perception out there that it's, it's a cash grab. And when, when they're saying, well, my pet hasn't, I don't even leave my pet outside. My pet is in the house all, all the time. And then I have some, individual come and say I want $120 for my fee for your, your dog and uh, I'm just concerned about that because I'm the one who gets the phone calls the angry phone calls and uh, and it makes us look not so uh, favorable so I, I just want to I want to I want to see that portion somewhat addressed sensitively Ms. Sure, you touched upon it in your opening statements, but it might be worthwhile to restate exactly where all of the revenue goes that's raised from um, licensing. Um, right. What we, we get $209,000 back each year from the licensing. The Humane Society gets, 
the other portion of that licensing funding and they're counting on an increase in what they collect in order to offset us having no increase. Now I understand we've, we've dealt with complaints as well when people feel that it's unfair or that they're being targeted or they don't like people knocking on their door. What we're hoping is that by changing the licensing provisions and making the licenses more fair and that they last the 12 months, um, that we'll get less of that pushback. Also, I think there's a public education piece and when people understand what the money's being used for and the benefits to them for having a license, that, that assists. I, I don't, again, I don't disagree with what the benefits are. I just, what, I, what I'm not pleased with is the way it, the perception in, is that we're going out and cash grab. So as long as we can look at that in a sensitive manner, I'll be happy. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. I, I just want to reiterate what Councillor Ionetta said because I experienced exactly that, uh, somebody coming to my door and knocking on my door. But what was really disturbing is, is some of the, we have a lot of dogs on our street, people who had, whose dogs had passed away. And it was almost, for one of them, it was heart-wrenching to have somebody knock on the door and say, you need to license your dog, and the dog had passed away. So just, just a, a little anecdotal uh, information. Um, I don't agree with the door-to-door. -door. I think we do have to have to find a, a, a better way um, of, of getting the licensing. I think the 12-month licensing is probably going to do that. I think people will at least feel that it's fair. So um, as a dog owner, that, that's, I think that's really critical. One of the questions I had was, um, what is the cost of... So I, I heard $120. But then I heard another number. So what is our licensing fee at this point in time? Um, for a sterilized dog, just normal, it starts off at I believe $27 and by the end of March 31st if you haven't licensed that dog the fee goes up to $74. Um, as I mentioned when the new fees come forward to council there's significant changes to the structure of those licenses for reducing the categories by almost half and you won't see quite as much discrepancy in the prices for a, a late license. Okay. Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> That's why I was thinking, where's the 120? I don't remember paying that. <laughs> right. um, that may be for a restricted dog. They're, they're more expensive to license because there's more enforcement components with them. Okay. Um, as that, sitting on the dog appeal committee, I, I completely understand why we needed some of these changes, and I, and, and I certainly support them um, as well. And I think the, the licensing, of course, does present uh, a bit of uh, public perception and a bit of a concern. I think how we roll that out, how we market that, and how we educate the public is critical. There are a lot of dogs out there. Thank you. Councillor Glenn Graham. Thank you. Great job. And uh, I noticed you skirted the whole cat issue this time, but maybe that'll come up next time. Um, one thing that I think we could do better is to consult around the off leash areas and um, as someone who was on a board called Doggerloo, there was a number of issues there related to uh, pet behavior and picking up and things like that and I think that we need some uh, guidelines that would be posted on the, uh, the fence and some enforcement on a sporadic basis but also to consult as Councillor Cazola said, that's a constituent group that really could benefit from asking what can we do better so that's an opportunity. Um, that I think we could pursue in the future. One thing that I would suggest is that uh, Councillor Gazzola was talking about, uh, as he was talking, I think he mentioned even a, like a 24-month period, and I think that, that has some merit for people who want to avoid the hassle. Maybe they could, just like when you get a driver's license, you can get it for a longer period, just to, to do that, to be proactive, because it's uh, another thing to remember. So uh, if you have a younger dog, that would be something that people might want to invest in and make everyone's life easier. If I could, the bylaw, the new bylaw will provide for a 24-month license. It can't be implemented right away because administratively there's computer software type things to get in place. But when the new wording is passed, it will allow the Humane Society to do that as they can. Um, as for the off-leash areas, there are regulations posted. There is enforcement from time to time. It's a matter of priority. So if that's something that we perhaps need more enforcement, on and can take it away from another area, I'm sure the Humane Society would accommodate. And Mr. Turner to comment? 
Through you, Mr. Chairman, just with regard to the dog leash uh, um, issue, what we're going to be looking at for this spring is through uh, our enforcement officers as well as the Humane Society, we're going to be proactively uh, and periodically, I will say periodically, but proactively uh, um, at the dog uh, or at the leash free zones um, providing some public information. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's a combination of enforcement and uh, public education, but our approach is going to be more about talking to the owners about how um, they need to be responsible even, you know, you know, when the dogs are in the pen because uh, the number of complaints we're getting about uh, dog behavior inside of the, uh, the leash free areas is increasing. Okay, there are no further questions. Could it, would someone like to move this? Moved by Councillor Glenn Graham. Um, any comments? Not seeing any, I'll just comment briefly, thanking staff for bringing this forward. I know it's uh, part of the larger uh, responsible pet ownership strategy, but I appreciate that, uh, that we're getting this in earlier so that uh, the dogs in the city can benefit um, this year. Uh, I sit on the uh, dog designation committee along with Councillor Fernandez, and uh, we know the, the difficulty sometimes. I mean, oftentimes the issue isn't so much with uh, the dog as it is its owners, in all honesty. Um, but that's why we have rules like this that we put in place to make sure that they're taken care of. So I will be very happy to support this. Uh, so those in favor. And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item number five, the termite bylaw update. This one's me too. Do you want me to oh, sorry. get into it? <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, Ms. Sherry, when you're ready. Okay, thanks. So when the termite issue first came up, we looked at our old bylaw. We found that it was out of date. It was based on old legislation and a promise of provincial funding that no longer exists. The bylaw had never been enforced. After hearing from Dr. Miles, the city realized the bylaw could be improved and council asked staff to update the bylaw. Building, enforcement and legal were involved in the review of the bylaw. We listened to Dr. Miles' suggestions and incorporated them where possible. For example, we've made provision for monitoring of termites on private property, and that was an aspect that Dr. Miles had identified as being crucial. He had also suggested wooden sheds and fences structures could perhaps be treated with borate, so we've, again, modified the bylaw to allow for that to happen um, and allow structures that have been treated that way to remain without the soil treatment. Dr. Miles also kindly looked at looked over a draft of the bylaw and made some suggestions which we also implemented. The critical changes to the bylaw are outlined in the report. I'm not sure if you'd like me to go through them one by one or if the report was sufficient. Councillor Gazzola? Yeah, I would like you to touch if what, what radical changes are there in this as compared to the original bylaw? Sure. Yeah. One yeah. of the things that we talked about were powers of entry. Our old bylaw limited inspections to sort of known termite areas, if you will, and within a distance of a property that's been identified. We've changed it now so that staff are able to inspect all property across the city as necessary. Um, we've also, in the powers of entry section, allowed for staff to place traps on private property and enter as they need to to monitor termite populations. The owner obligations were changed a little bit the bylaw now allows for buildings and structures built in accordance with building code regulations for sort of termite areas to be to remain on the properties. Also allows for the chemical treatment of wooden structures like fences and decks. We've removed other wood destroying insects from the bylaw. The old bylaw, although it was focused on termites, also included all wood destroying insects. When we looked at that, the requirements of the bylaw are really specific to termites. They're not appropriate for other types of insects. Things like carpenter ants, which might be a common one, can be dealt with under the property standards bylaw, so they don't need to be included in this bylaw. Oh, yep. Can you click? Yeah. Yeah, other than you. those issues there that but those, you, you clearly uh, set them out. Yeah, I, I tried to, save you, save thank you. you. <laughs> I tried to highlight the things that were major changes. Other things, you know, wording 
just trying to clean things up, um, nothing substantial other than what was listed. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is uh, definitely a step in the right direction, and uh, I'm glad that it's finally here to clarify the, uh, the wordage and responsibilities of the homeowner, and of course, what the uh, actions of the city will take. Um, and I think the, uh, the bylaw articulates the responsibilities of the homeowner quite clearly and uh, without confusion. Uh, one thing that I was still looking to, and you refer this to, that uh, the bylaw will allow, obviously, property access for mo continuing monitoring as well as uh, treatment for borate rods into sheds and fencing structures or any wooden posts outside. Sorry, if the city participates in treatment, um, we would still need property owner consent to do that. Um, but there is access for the termite monitoring. Oh, I see. Okay, so we will still need to get the uh, continual, uh, I guess, permission from the, the individual homeowners to be able to go and treat the soil as well, because I think that was an additional measure of the, uh, the program, remediation program as well. The soil treatment is different in the sense that it's a requirement under the bylaw. So if a homeowner were not to treat the soil when they were ordered to do it, we could go in and do that to bring their property into compliance and bill it to taxes. The confusion is this for me anyways. Uh, the homeowner is responsible to protect their structure. So they have to inject you know, whatever the necessary chemicals are, or the process that needs to be done uh, to protect the actual shell, the structure. But treating the soil, it was my understanding that the city of Kitchener, twice a year, spring and fall, would, uh, would be doing treatment, certain treatments of soil on the uh, full block. As okay, well. sorry, I was talking okay. about the soil injections. No, no. I believe you're talking about the nematodes. That's right. Um, for that, it's the same sort of thing. It's not a requirement of the bylaw that that be done. So if the city implements that program, it would be with consent of the property owners. Okay, so that, that was my only concern. Does it, need to, does it need to be articulated in the bylaw itself? or? Uh... I think because that was a little bit exploratory, if you will, it wasn't an appropriate thing staff felt to make property owners do. And unless we make them do it first in the bylaw, we can't go in and do it for them. So that would be something on consent. Okay, all right. It's understandable. I, I, I know where you're getting at. Uh, again, council has already given direction that this is a program that the city will lead, but it, I, I, I can understand the differentiation as to uh, requiring access as opposed to working with the homeowners there. Okay, so. Okay, no further questions. Would someone like to move this? Moved by Councillor Singh. Uh, no comments, not seeing any. Those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item six. Mr. Chapman. Thank you, Chair Davey. I'll keep my comments fairly brief. Council will recall that as a part of the program that Councillor Singh has just alluded to, you directed staff to go back and develop a loan program for the properties that are currently the subject of the termite control orders. We went through all of the minutes of previous discussions and tried to build a program that corresponded as closely as possible to your previous direction on the issue, and that's outlined in the report before you today. I'd also point out that the report was circulated by hand to the 23 properties in the neighbourhood with contact information for staff, which, were there any questions or comments. And as of late last week, we had received no contact from residents with either questions or comments on the report. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Yeah, and uh, I haven't heard too much uh, from the residents uh, after the circulation. I'd like to thank staff for having taken that extra step of circulating the notices to the households. That shows that we, have, uh, we are absolutely trying to take every necessary step to make sure that they're engaged and involved in this, uh, in this process. Uh, my question to the, uh, I guess, the, the recommendation that's before us, and I think it's uh, pretty close to what was uh, directed by council and what the intent was as an assistance. Uh, there is a, a um, I guess, uh, an interest component to the loan uh, that's uh, 2%, uh, similar to the infrastructure and terrier rates. So is this money that we, uh, the city will be borrowing first, and then uh, if requested, lending it out to the homeowner, or would it just come from a reserve? Through the chair, based on the amounts we're talking about, we would be able to cash flow this through our own cash balances. I believe the intent of council was to ensure that any foregone interest earnings would be recouped through the interest rate on the loan, and that's why we've chosen that infrastructure Ontario rate as the proxy. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. That's, that's understandable. I wasn't sure if we were boring to begin with. Uh, that was, uh, Mr. Chair, my only concern. I have comment as to the uh, 
the interest. I, I see that there is a uh, cost for registering, but that's understandable. But I'll speak to the, uh, the interest component through my comments. Very good. Thank you. Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, I actually, I had a question about the interest rate. Uh, I, I thought we were being, I thought it should be a little bit higher. Uh, it's, I, I believe in, a, in providing a reasonable interest rate. Uh, if someone goes to the bank nowadays and can get loans at prime plus one, they're, they're really fortunate. So I, I thought that, uh, especially in that there will be some work involved on behalf of the city so that perhaps the loan, the interest rate should be, there should be somewhat of a difference from, from that rate. So that, that, that is one, one of the concerns that I had. Uh, the, other, the other issue, um, on page six, when you talk about affordable loans provided at direct cost, what, what do you mean by at direct cost? Is that, is that not adding a quarter of a percent or half a percent to what you're paying for the money? Uh, through the chair, no. I think it does speak to the point you've raised, though. As you know, um, from local improvements and other programs, there is staff time involved in administering these agreements. We've only tried to recoup the, the true out-of-pocket costs here. There's no provision made for any staff time to administer the program. Hmm. Which I feel there should be. Right. And, we would and, and, it, and it still is fair and reasonable. Uh, I feel that if there's a, a minor difference in the interest rate. So, all right, that answers that. The other, the other thing is, wh why would this, this plan not relate to the entire city? Why is it restricted to a to one particular area. I mean, this is a this is a, a help to our people, but it, who knows? This could crop up anywhere, and we, we we're, we're back into the same problem. So, what is the harm in applying it as a universal uh, policy? Through the chair, as we went back through the discussions on count, from council on this issue, it was our understanding that. The real concern here was that we had an old bylaw on the books that referenced grants and loans, and it was Councillor Singh's position, I believe shared by Council, that it was not fair for those homeowners to say there would be no grant or loan available to them when there was a bylaw on the books that provided for it, and that we had an obligation, therefore, to at least provide a loan, but then as Ms. Shurier has done, revise the bylaw and remove, going forward, that provision of a grant or a loan for affected homeowners. So, this approach has been consistent with that discussion of council over successive meetings. Well, when it comes to appropriate time, I'd like to uh, pass an amend recommend an amendment that it applies to the entire city. Okay. The other, uh, so you, you can add these to the property taxes, I gather, from what I read. Correct. Uh, Through the chair, we can add them, but they do not enjoy no, that's priority the status. Yeah, you can, you can try and... But it would not be legally enforceable. Yeah. Uh, so the, does a lien give a lien gives you that full protection? I believe substantially, yes, it does. Although if, if uh, a lien would mean that you had to go move in and sell the property, right? Perhaps Ms. Shurier can comment on the difference between priority lien status and the lien that would be registered here. Sorry, sure, go ahead. If I compare it perhaps to our furnace financing type contracts, what we do, and they're for similar smaller amounts, we register the lien, we don't go in and sell the property, we allow it to sit and accumulate, and if the property is sold, that gets paid out. Okay, so, so, the, so the lien sits forever, is that right? Generally... Well, we remove it if people meet their payment obligations, of course. If they haven't met their payment obligations, it would sit generally until the property is sold. And, and in that case, the interest keeps, or whatever keeps, is there any, is there any penalty of increased interest at, at that point that uh, they default on their commitment? Or yes, do they, if we... Or do they continue to get this really reasonable rate for... In perpetuity. We could set something up 
in the lien that there would be interest at a certain amount, um, perhaps an additional amount if it wasn't paid in a timely manner? Yeah, I'd, I'd like you to look at that if we could. Thank well, through the chair, I think the intent is because it would be added to taxes at the point it becomes in default, the penalty and interest rate would be the same rate that applies to taxes, which, as you know, is considerably higher than 2%. That's fine. <laughs> but would that go, would that carry on into the lien? We would structure it that so that as soon as it's transferred to the property taxes, that becomes the rate at which the penalty is charged. Okay, that, that, that does it then. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Glenn Graham. Thanks very much. My only question related to objective number five, because when I brought forward a, uh, a motion on this, my intent was a universal loan that would be future focused for everyone. So I fully support Councillor Gazzola's uh, amendment. I think it makes sense. Otherwise, we'd have people coming before us with the same issue in the future, and we'd have to consider like uh, treating uh, people like in like manner. And I think that that would be requiring us to amend the bylaw at that point. So I think the whole point is to to do it right the first time, and uh, therefore I, I fully support the amendment. Councillor Rubinovich, thanks. Uh, <coughs> I am. Uh, I've been listening to some of the discussion and debate with respect to um, the issue of you know whether it should be just those properties specifically or or the uh, the community as a whole. And I would agree. I mean, it was my understanding that if we enacted this, it would apply to the com community as a whole. So just to be absolutely clear, then when it comes to we can put it onto taxes if that's the course of action we decide. If we do that, it then accumulates at the tax rate of interest, which is 15%? That's correct. Okay. Um, so in other words, it's in everyone's interest to, to pay it off within the five years. Correct. And if, it, and if not, then it would not simply, it, we, we couldn't act on it as we would on taxes, but it would continue accumulating and we would simply be after the first mortgage holder, which is the banks. Again, I would look for Ms. Scherrier to comment on whether or not the lien would take first position. Priority liens under the Municipal Act do. I'm not certain in this case whether or not it would be in first position. Ms. Scherrier. Sorry. It would go on to the property after what is already on the property. So it would be second to a mortgage that was already registered. Um, in some cases, if somebody wished to refinance, perhaps they could ask us to allow that to come on. Uh, you probably don't need that detail, sorry. Okay, well, I, I guess that's what I'm just trying to understand is what, what if any risk is there for us in terms of not getting the money back? And, and so a first mortgage, we would fall after that, correct? We would fall after anything already registered on title. So okay. if a property were financed to the hilt, there may not presently be enough equity to cover the lien as well. Um, generally, the property values do tend to go up, and perhaps by the time of a sale, there would be enough there to, to cover it. Okay, and after, um, after anything that's registered presently, we would then be number one on the list? So in other words, if there's nothing there today, we would become number one. If there's a first mortgage there, we put a lien on and they go for a second mortgage. After that, we would be between the first and the second. Unless we consented to something different, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor Ioannidis. Yeah, through you, Chair Davey. Um, I guess my question is, um, how, 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 we're, obviously we're going to be ca holding the cash on this uh, 184000 if this is opened up to the whole city, how are we going to deal with that? Because that would, this is going to open up a whole can of worms uh, on holding cash and reserves and everything else. We, we're not a bank. So I, I would like to know a little bit more what we would do. Would we charge extra interest or to cover, would we take out the loan and then, you know. Mr. Chapman. Uh, through the chair, I don't think we're in any position to predict what the upper limit might be if it was extended indefinitely citywide. Again, our understanding was that council wanted to honor the obligation under the old bylaw for the residents that were aware of the bylaw. 
uh, but then to amend the bylaws has been being done today and to exit the program. But certainly we're in council's hands if council would like to take a different direction. Okay, and my other question was, is, is pertaining to Councillor Gazola. Are you, your amendment, did you say you wanted to, you just wanted to bring it to the whole entire community? Yeah, uh, sir, he hasn't brought forward his amendment yet, but he okay. indicated he wanted to bring forward, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Gazola, but you wanted to make this loan available to anyone that obviously gets a terminal infestation. In the city. Okay, so there was no extra cost in there because I would like to see us recoup all our costs, staff time, because reality is this is out of our spectrum of, of, of business, so I don't know why we would be out of pocket for that. So I would like to see the true cost passed on to the homeowner. So, okay, we'll deal with that when the amendment okay. comes forward. Chair, sure, uh, can I just make one, oh, one additional certainly. point just for, for perfect clarity? Under object, uh, Objective 5, which is the one that referenced the loans only being available to the 23 property owners. The other provision we've made there is the, the first one, that loans are intended to be a one-time loan. And again, it's our understanding that there may be an ongoing requirement to treat properties over time. And our position here was that when it comes as the initial shock to the homeowner and it's a huge out-of-pocket cost, the city is stepping in to provide relief. But this is not intended to become an ongoing permanent revolving line of credit, which is why that provision has been put in place. And Ms. Sure. One thing I wanted to add to is that right now, we don't know if anyone will want one of these loans or how many people will. If there's only one or two people who take it up to put the whole cost of the program onto those people, it would make it not a very good loan for them. Um, it would probably be cheaper for the city to go in and do the work and apply it to taxes than to bill one or two people needing a loan with the whole cost of a loan program. Okay. Uh, Councillor Singh, you just said comment, right? Yeah. Correct. Okay, I'm just sorry, I'm just gonna ask a quick question if I could. So I just want to make sure I'm clear in my understanding because we did deal with this a little while ago um, and I think you touched upon it Mr. Chapman but the intention of this being before us is to help out the currently affected property owners because our previous bylaw had indicated there would be funding. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay so the difference between what's possibly proposed here and not is extending it. Um, so uh, presumably this would sunset what's before us as well. Okay. That's right. Um, and can you comment in general terms, I guess uh, I'm a little bit unclear because what we're talking about potentially doing is becoming, replacing a banking institution when it comes to loans. So is it typical for a municipality to engage in this? No, it's not. We've uh, been typically quite clear that it's not the municipality's role to act as a banker. And in our research, we've identified no other municipalities that provide termite loans or termite grants to affected property owners. Okay. And the last question is the difference between the municipality offering this loan and the private sector. In reality, we're saving them. There isn't really any difference. They could, they, presumably any of these homeowners could go to a private lending institution, and especially if they own the property, and take out a line of credit, for example, and the only real difference is they'd be paying likely a, a slightly higher percentage rate on that loan. Assuming they have equity in their property, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move into comments. Oh, yes, question, Councillor Benovich. Sorry, just, um, I think two things actually. Um, number one, in terms of uh, other properties, do we have any sense of, of numbers of, of termite properties throughout the city? Since we last dealt with this? don't think we have that. Mr. May? Through you, Mr. Chair, I would suggest to you that we have no definitive uh, sense. We have, since this issue was raised in the public, had a number of different uh, residents from different areas of the municipality come forward. Some have been confirmed and some haven't, but uh, we have no specific number. Okay. Um, and, and then I guess the other point, I mean, as we consider the implications of making this citywide, and I understand some of the points that staff have made around trying to balance the fact that there was a bylaw in the books versus, you know, how we treat this and, and other things. Um, I, I guess in, in many respects, there are others who are dealing with Emerald Dashboard and other things on their own properties and they're having to deal with those expenses on their own with, with no help, correct? That's correct, and um, as Ms. Sherry indicated, there are other wood-destroying insects, for example, carpenter ants, which are not as um, threatening in terms of how they, they relocate, but certainly can do as much damage um, to wood and require as much remediation of structures. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, and actually, before we get to uh, comments, I do need a mover for this. Anyone moved by Councillor Singh? And comments, Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you. And just through the, uh, I guess, the questions and the line of questioning and some comments that have been made, I'd like to, again, just refresh. And I think, uh, uh, with credit to Mr. Chapman, I think he's captured uh, and reiterated exactly what the initial intent was. I'm glad he's got a better memory than all of us here as to how the conversation had drawn out and gone with. The, uh, the, the rationale for the, uh, the assistance program, again, we had talked about providing a grant as well, and understandably that had defeated, was the fact that the intent was to be fair, to be fair the fact that these 23 property owners had brought their issue uh, forward to the city uh, in recognizing that this, uh, this problem existed and at the same time that there was a bylaw that spoke to it and that by bylaw uh, inaccurately uh, had uh, recommendations or provisions within it that spoke to funding model that uh, wasn't appropriately budgeted to begin with. And that's, that's why the item just before that we approved, we've amended that. We've amended that bylaw to be respectful and responsible to our residents so they, uh, they know exactly what their responsibility is and what provisions or assistance is before them. And I, I think it would be very difficult to, to turn this into a citywide program, just the, the, the funding uh, constraints to it. But uh, if this is a recommendation that's being put forward, I think it would be best served if it was deferred to get more information from, from staff as well. But to speak to the item that's before us, I think uh, uh, one of the other questions that was asked, uh, I think it was through you, uh, Mr. Chair, as to this could easily be something that the residents can go to their own institution. I think we're taking a, a little bit of a, a leap there because we don't know all the circumstances of all homeowners. And uh, I'm of the opinion not a lot of people will probably, there will be uptake on this. Um, many probably have the capacity and ability to do this on, on their own. This is really for those one or two that don't have any means because they may have poor credit. They may not have any equity on their home. Uh, they, their employment situation may not allow them to uh, be approved for uh, additional loan, whatever the case may be. And if they don't comply, they don't have the funding mo model to do uh, methods to, to comply by the order. But now we just uh, 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 we increase the fee from 5,000, what was initially outlined in the, the first bylaw, to 25,000. So it's a considered onerous uh, responsibility that's being shifted onto the homeowner, and respect, and uh, rightly so. I think uh, this is a uh, this is a, a serious problem that needs to be tackled with and considered. But I think we have to be uh, fair and ensure that the provision is there to assist those 23 property owners that have been responsibly come forward and properly laid out what the problem exists in the community. I think we may we have heard from some, or there have been indications. This is not a new topic. This is not something that just came before us most recently. We've been talking about this for this uh, termite problem over the, the entire summer. And so far, there has been a very limited amount of people that come forward and explicitly said this is something that they're dealing with and they're requiring this additional assistance too. So I think those two uh, arguments as to should it be citywide and as to if it should be led on this 23 properties because we are changing the bylaw and we're making sure that these 23 properties are captured as to some of the wordage that was articulated in the previous bylaw. I think those are two very distinct and different arguments and that's why I think they should be voted separately and as well as the other should be deferred to get more information. But I would hope that at least this component as that's laid out before us is supported as it was initially supported by council before the election. Thank you. And we will now go to Councillor Gazzola to introduce. I'm glad I get a chance to put my amendment up before everybody shoots it down. <laughs> Apologies. It's just the way it works sometimes. All right. My amendment, I, I don't believe in, in passing uh, site-specific bylaws. I think we are a community. If we do something, we should do it for the entire community. Now, going back to our earlier discussions on this, and I remember well, and I remember speaking, I was totally opposed to the city spending uh, funds to assist property owners. I was, uh, the, the, and the whole concept of this grant that was in, that was uh, brought forward by the province and quickly uh, eliminated without really telling anybody. And, I, and at that point I said, I could support, it, it, it looked like an epidemic, and I could support making loans available uh, to, to people uh, if we could do it and it w at no cost to the city. Okay? And I think I've seen that uh, before. 
uh, the, the thoughts that the, we're the banker, we, we sometimes tend to be the bankers. Uh, for example, with the Kitchener Rangers, we're a very big banker. Anyhow, when I first started today, and that's why I felt that the interest rate, and we're going to go into it, should be adequate not only to pass on a really good interest rate, which we are, which we are seeing today, who knows what the future will bring, but to add a, to add a minor point to that that would cover our costs. So that it would be revenue neutral as far as the city was concerned. But, that, but yet it would be very helpful to a group of people that have come upon uh, a serious situation that uh, uh, it, it's in the entire city's benefit to correct this situation and correct it immediately. So uh, my, my main point here is and I don't think it's going to come out to uh, such a humongous thing that we're going to have to go and start uh, borrowing money. And if we do, even so, maybe we borrow money, but we put in our, our little added amount to recoup what our costs are. It's a, I, I'm uh, looking at a revenue neutral uh, thing here, but it should be open to everyone. You can't just put it in for my neighborhood. And, and, and this whole question, I'm just leaning towards the question, uh, should we be getting into this or not? And, and we had a lot of arguments about, about termite, about uh, other ants and squirrels and all of these other things, and we went along and said, yes, we're going to do this. So now we're coming back and saying, uh, no, uh, we, we've got other problems that we're not going to do it. And, and I... I, I know what I speak when it comes to it, the emerald ash bar and squirrels in my in my thing in my, in my neighborhood in my in my attic. So, uh, if we're going to pass rules, rules should apply to everyone, not just to, to a certain area. And at revenue neutral, as far as the city is concerned. Mayor Zer. Thank you. Um, <coughs> When I was first uh, looking for or looking uh, at the proposals about a loan program, I was uh, opposed to it and uh, did not, not uh, was not supportive of it. However, it's the restriction that I hear to the that area that I will somewhat reluctantly support, but I will support it. In fact, it's been said a couple times now. The reason we're even dealing with this is that the original bylaw was not repealed years ago when it should have been. That probably wouldn't have been raised at this point in time about a, any uh, financial support. So this assists those who are in that particular situation with the knowledge of the old bylaw. I will not support uh, expanding it to the rest of the city because I think the original purpose was to repeal the bylaw as we had we were doing initially. If for some reason uh, the majority of council would go along and expand it to the entire city, I think it should have a sunset clause. And it would make sense that the sunset clause would be tying into the application date which is October 31, 2015. So this doesn't come up again. And that limits it. But I don't think it should be there in the first place because of the original uh, repeal that was intended. <coughs> so um, there are probably a couple of steps that could be taken here, but um, certainly no later than the October 31, 15, 2015. But I will not support expanding it as the original uh, or the amendment is, is suggested. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll actually, I'll echo those comments. Uh, I, I think, I agree with Councillor Gazzola that it's not clean the way we're, we're dealing with this, but the reality is we're dealing with it only because, as Mayor Zare pointed out, uh, there was a false expectation created by a bylaw that should have been wiped out a long time ago. So this is, not the best way of, well, it's, it's not the cleanest way of dealing with it, but I think it's better than offering nothing to the affected residents that 
um, noticed the problem and came to council when our erroneous bylaw was still in place because the province had pulled the funding for it. So I'm not totally content with approving this, but I think it's uh, the, the, the lesser of two evils to, to apply it to this particular situation. But in the long run, I just, I can't, it doesn't make much sense for the city to be lending out money uh, as a banking institution, in my opinion, to multiple property owners for really what, at some point we have to draw a line, and this is something that is the responsibility of property owners uh, in the fullness of time. So I won't be supporting any sort of expansion of it, and if council does approve an expansion of it, I would also seek uh, a sunset clause of an appropriate amount of time for anyone that comes forward, whether it be a year or two years, because this does have to get off of our books at some point. Uh, so we will first vote on the amendment, which is... Okay, actually a couple of people have cropped up here. Um, <coughs> Councillor Gazzola, could you... Sorry? No. No, not, not conflicts. Uh, Councillor Gazzola, I just want to make sure I understand. So your motion would be that staff um, extend this program to the entire city of Kitchener for people that have... Yes. So, yeah, can you get your microphone? Just, we need clarity on this, so. But, I, but also that the, uh, that the interest rate be looked at so to make it reven, revenue neutral. Make it revenue neutral, okay. okay. And, okay. Uh, that's the clarification. That's the clarification. Oh, the, okay. Our, process, our sure. protocol was to have that on a written, a written motion so that we can all see that so there is no discrepancy. I believe, I'll look to the clerk, I believe that is the process definitely for council. I'm not sure for that formal in committee. Well, I think it's for okay. all. Okay, so. All. Does everybody understand it? Does it need to be written down? Uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm comfortable with it as is. Uh, Councilor Rabanovich for comment. Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> one uh, quick question or, question or request for additional info um, for next Monday when it comes to council, and that's, if there's anybody else that we're aware of that's had a problem in the last, you know, cu couple of years and should be considered under those same rules and essentially be grandfathered in addition to this street, I, I want to be aware of them so that we can include and give them that same option because I think the principle should apply. I, 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 in listening to, to everything that I've heard, I, I tend to agree that it should be limited now and we shouldn't be expanding it to the entire city, but I want to make sure that in, in you know, putting it out there under the, the, the pretense that um, we had a bylaw in place and that's what people were looking to, I want to make sure that um, it's offered to everybody who we're aware of that had an issue prior to this. Okay. So my suggestion, okay, Mr. May, do you want to comment? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we can certainly endeavor to do that. I want to be very clear, this is the only, uh, these are the only properties for which we've issued an order. Uh, there are no other properties in the city for which an order has been issued. There are rumors of other properties, and so I guess we'll endeavor, but I just would caution Council, I'm not sure the quality of the information you'll receive. Councilor Bennett. That's fine, and no doubt, I mean, we saw all three media outlets here, or three of the local media outlets here earlier, two are still here. No doubt, uh, if somebody comes forward, uh, they'll be able to have read about it, hopefully in the next week as well. Okay, so we'll see what happens here, and let's not forget that we do have another chance to address this at Council uh, to fine tune, which is why not having it not written out, I'm not terribly concerned about it, because I think most of Council understands. Uh, the amendment. So we will vote on the amendment first, and a recorded vote has been called. Sorry, can you click in? I don't. Uh, is there portions of the amendment? Because I won't support citywide. Like, I mean, I'll support never. No, no. The, the, the amendment is citywide. The then, then the main motion is right. But he has a revenue neutral portion that I want to support in his amendment. Uh, okay. One second here. And Mr. Chapman, if you want to comment while I'm writing. Only to say there are two separate parts to the motion, and so it is Council's prerogative to split it and deal with the citywide aspect separate from the full cost recovery aspect. Okay. So I th think it's appropriate looking to Council, probably appropriate to vote on the um, citywide aspect first. Actually, Councilor Gazzola, I'll leave it to you because it's your motion. 
citywide aspect first or, or revenue neutral aspect first? I'm easy. You're easy, okay. Uh, we'll vote on, well, I guess one requires the other, so I guess we'll vote on the revenue neutral aspect first. Uh, Councillor Singh. Just a quick comment on the last addition to split the motion into two on the revenue neutral. My only comment would be we're talking about a few hundred dollars that will tarnish our image where our intent was to assist and will come across as if this is additional investment vehicle. This is not an investment vehicle. Okay. So recorded vote first on the portion of whether the expansion uh, oh, actually, Councillor Singh raises an interesting point because supposing for a moment a member of council like myself uh, wants to support the original recommendation but doesn't want to change the figures. Um, because if we support the revenue neutral first, then we don't have the opportunity to have the original in place. Why don't I make it easy for you sure. and take out the revenue neutral? That's something that I would like to see both parts. And let's just deal on whether. We pass something that, uh, that relates to the whole community or we're going to have a site-specific uh, issue here. That makes it considerably simpler, Councillor Gazzola. Thank you. Okay. So we will now vote the amendment is going citywide or not. So the amendment is to go citywide. Recorded vote has been called. Those in favor? And opposed? The motion fails. Okay, so we are now back to the main motion as written in a very messy way, but here we are. Uh, I think recorded votes have been asked for this as well on the main motion. Those in favor? And opposed? And that motion carries. Okay, we're on to the uh, final discussion item. This is the information to public about school designations and school boundaries, item number seven. Mr. Pinard. When yes, good morning, Chair Davey. Um, this report is a follow-up to a council motion on the issue of new homeowners having the correct information regarding school boundaries. In summary, the report confirms that we cannot withhold building permits, but there are a few things that we can do. Uh, we can do things to improve awareness of the school boundaries and to improve the lines of communication. And we have recommended a few specific actions regarding that and those actions are contained in the report. The thrust of those actions is to get new homeowners to contact the school boards and to have the correct contact information. Okay. Thank you. Councillor gallery luck Yeah, I just want to thank staff uh, for bringing this forward uh, and I'd like to move it. I just do have one question though. Um, and it's with respect to uh, the second paragraph of the recommendation that was from um, August 25th at the bottom of the page on 7-1. Uh, and I know that we have nothing that we can strongly um, enforce with respect to um, notifying the residents uh, that have already purchased, but the, the, the public meetings are coming up. Um, is this something that we can continue to connect with the homeowners uh, and the developer association? I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head right now. Um, when we have those discussions with them on a yearly basis to encourage them to um, notify any residents who have purchased homes in new areas that uh, don't currently live there so they wouldn't get that notification? Yes, through you, Chair Davey. Uh, it is something we've actually, uh, that we can do, and we've actually had uh, good conversations on this with both the development industry and the school boards, and um, all parties involved re uh, do realize that it is a challenge. Essentially, it's people who are moving from outside of the area to the area. We know the geography of the area in question, but the people aren't there yet. Um, and uh, the best that we can do is, is get the information uh, at the time of sale, at the sales trailers, uh, and do our very best to make sure that uh, the 
the, um, the people who are involved have the correct information. Unfortunately, what happens is that some people are passing on information to prospective new homeowners uh, based on speculation or they're not 100% sure. And the very best source of information are the four school boards. And, um, and it's really to get the contact information for the four school boards out there and get them to continue to contact. The school boards um, have mentioned that they uh, very rarely um, make school board boundary changes um, during like a, a summer period or during a period where uh, that is where they, they don't know what's coming between the time that a, per a property would be purchased and sold. They usually have a, a fairly long transitional time. Uh, so uh, if they're ever contacted, they would be giving the, the correct information to, to the homeowners. I just think anything we can do even to continue to have the dialogue with the school board and the development industry uh, is important because, you know, some people do purchase their homes, uh, you know, a year before they get to move in and sometimes there are changes yeah. that happen with boundaries. And so anything we can do to continue that dialogue would be great, but I appreciate what um, our jurisdiction is and the abilities that we have to try and help the situation are limited. So I appreciate staff's work on this and bringing this forward. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez. Thanks. Um, I too want to. I'm, I'm really glad that we're doing something, but I still don't know that it, it's enough. Um, is it? Would it be within our jurisdiction um, to insist that at all the, the the mobile model homes, sorry, or at the trailers, that at least something is posted that um, when when people are looking at buying a house or buying a property, that the information for the school boards is posted there. Because right now there's, there's nothing there. And if you are looking at buying a house and, and all you're looking at is four or five model homes, you have no idea what the landscape is, is in, the, in the future, you have no sense of what's gonna happen. And you know we've been struggling with this in my ward um, with a school that, that needs to be built because of, of uh, overpopulation. So I think that in good faith, maybe what we should be asking the uh, Home Builders Association is in that, that every model home or every model trailer has uh, the information posted that if you want information about school board bound, school boundaries, that this is where you need to, to go to. It's really just a simple sheet of paper that could be uh, applied at those locations. Yeah, uh, through you, Chair Davey, I'm not 100% sure what our authority is to obligate, but uh, to uh, request that that be done uh, would fit in with the scope of what we are recommending in terms of actions for, for improving dialogue, and that's something that we can do. That the information itself would be contained in all purchase and sale uh, agreements as a condition of draft approval. So not only is it and uh, brought to the uh, to the homeowner's attention, but their lawyer, who's actually assisting with the purchase and sale, um, uh, uh, would be in a position to to make them aware of that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions. Um, yeah, Councillor Gallagher, you'd like to moving this item? Okay, those in favor, and that carries unanimously. And that does conclude the discussion items. Councillor Fernandez. Yes, um, I would like to um, to move the um, variance report into a discussion. I do have a few questions. Certainly, take a motion on that. Okay, uh, the motion, actually, if you don't mind, if you want to move the insurance pool as well. Oh, okay, I'll move the insurance pool as well to be moved into a discussion item. Um, so. oh. okay. A question on three as well. Okay, so why don't we just... Councillor Fernandez, just to save some time, would you like to move the entire... I'll move all the uh, information items okay. into a discussion item. Okay. Those in favour? And that's carried. Okay, Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. Um, just looking at the, um, the sanitary sewer utility on um, IF1-3, I, I guess I was kind of puzzled as, as to how we're... We have a de like such a uh, intense, de uh, such a high deficit on on this item, and I don't know whether it's 
it talks about less sewer charge revenue consistent with less water consumption, but it also at some point it talked about, um, I have to go through my pages a bit further, on page um, 15, it talks about less credits are used because there was less, there was more rain. I, I, I'm having a hard time understanding the connection that if the less, wa the less credits were used because of the amount of rain we had, I'm not understanding the connection here. Or am I reading this incorrectly yet? Okay, I'm not seeing any staff click in at the moment. Uh, Mr. Whitmer. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the revenue side, if you're looking at it, um, IF1-15 uh, is for the storm um, sewer utility as opposed to the sanitary, but I can speak specifically to the sanitary. Um, when we have a lot of uh, rain, we get um, potentially inflow into the pipes, which means then that our processing charges when it gets down to the treatment plant are up because there's more volume. Um, typically, um, that's, uh, that's the general uh, crux of the matter. We're trying to deal with the I&I &I that you've probably heard us speak about. Um, if we're looking at it in the context of um, uh, less water consumption, um, as people conserve water, um, then we don't get, we don't bill for that. And so our water rates then are, we have less money coming in, but we may have actually some additional sources of, of water that actually end up being treated. So that, that's why some of the variants. The other component was is that um, we spent an awful lot of our time dealing with um, storm sewer maintenance and repairs because of the rain as opposed to sanitary, so there's a reduction in our maintenance costs, which isn't necessarily a good thing um, because we do need to spend a lot more time and effort because our infrastructure is aging and in need of uh, more repair. Okay, okay. Yeah. so I, I was confusing the two items, and thanks for the clarification. Um, as I'm reading my notes, like, I see that one of the questions I had um, also pondered was it, when it talks on uh, the footnote, stormwater fee re revenue is lower than budget due to a combination of lower than forecasted growth. Uh, and the rate base and additional revenues are return, being returned to school properties. So how much is being returned to school properties? And additionally, um, if the growth rate is less, how much less and what is the percentage? Through, sure. through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think I can give you the details on that. I have to get that from Mr. Um, Golden. Okay. If, if it's possible to do that maybe between now and um, Council, I'd... I appreciate that. And Mr. Chapman, to comment? I can only comment. I'll comment on the school board side of it. This only relates to the French public and the French Catholic school boards. They were dutifully paying their rate while the other boards were contesting it. And when the province issued their position, we refunded those payments back to the French school boards. So they were in the tens of thousands of dollars, a relatively modest amount. Okay. So the other one, I can get some more response before Thursday, next Monday? Okay. Uh, and I think... That was the only question I had on, on that. Yeah, okay, we'll just actually deal with um, the variance report first. So we'll come back if you have further questions. Uh, Councillor Gazola. I have a whole bunch of questions, but I won't ask them. I'll send them to staff and I'll send council a copy. I, I do have three or four that I would like to ask. Um, the, the first one deals with, I was surprised, but not amazed to see an $800,000 uh, payment in lieu, uh, not discrepancy, a, a favorable variance. Did we not know that when we were setting the budget this year? That was, that's like having a hidden reserve there. We, we obviously knew, did we not, that we were going to get this uh, big uh, catch-up payment for, for the, uh, for the um, courthouse? Mr. Chapman? Through the chair, we knew that we would get assessment on the new courthouse. We had no information from MPAC about the assessed value, nor did we have any information on the write-offs that we'd be taking for the other courthouses that were being decommissioned. Mm -hmm. And so it's, not, it's never been our custom to budget for PILs, anticipating what may be. We, we bill based on the return roll. Except this is a substantial one that we're, we knew has a tremendous impact on us. Uh, it's, it's not a normal uh, payment in lieu, but uh, just on the, I, I noticed that the market, uh, the market has a surplus now of 
of uh, at the end of August. I don't of fifty thousand dollars, but that uh, tends to disappear by the year end. Is that what what's going to happen between the end of August and the end of the year to make that disappear? Through the chair, if that's included on the list of questions, we will respond that way. As the note indicates, there are we calendarized their budget, not perfectly, obviously, so the timing of revenues and expenses is slightly off compared to what the budget is forecast. Okay, okay that's fine, then. Um, the, uh, the other, well, the other question, so, sort of along those lines, dealt with gapping. At this point in time, we're $426,000 on the favorable side, but by the end of the year, that's going to decrease to 250000 What's happened? Uh, what's happened between August and and now the middle of, the, of November? To or can we look forward to the four hundred thousand favorable variance? Uh, you can if, if you don't have a quick answer, you can leave it and 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 get that back to us. Okay. The the. Uh, uh, supplementary taxes, I don't know where I r read it or heard it, uh, that the region is looking at some really favorable supplementary taxes for the year. Do we have any idea of, if, if they're having a good year, we got to be having a good year. So do we have any idea on where that's going? Through the chair, I think a lot of their favorable results are related to reassessments in Waterloo, not so much Kitchener, so obviously it's a region-wide number. Um, the current surplus would be based on, I believe, two supplementary rolls with one more to come, and also our calculation of, of write-offs that are pending. So the fact that there is no projection or deficit does not mean no analysis has been done. It means that based on what we anticipate for write-offs and the remaining supplementary role, we believe we'll come close to budget on that one this year. Okay, that's fine. You, you've suggested that the, there's been more growth in Waterloo than it is here. And their assessment growth numbers yeah. have borne that out recently. Okay, the only other, the other question I have, and I'm concerned about the gas works, the, um, the, there's a big, big uh, swing around in the, in the supply portion of it. There's a almost a four million dollar swing around how, how how is that going to be recouped through the chair um, so the swing around is a function of the cold winter and expensive gas purchases so that's the explanation for it uh, this is, uh, um, there is no projection to your end for gas given the inherent challenges in doing that. My understanding though is that staff believe that the current stabilization balance should come close to offsetting our negative variance for the year. So I think that there will be provision and stabilization there. It will leave us exposed though to another bad winter. So I don't believe that there's going to be a major rate impact associated with that this year, uh, but it will essentially deplete that stabilization balance. Well, we've we've already introduced an increase for that portion, have we not? From from 165 to 190. And so that's the other point that these are the figures that were estimated at the time of the rate change. So the rate change has taken all of these factors into account. It's now the middle of November. Do we have any better information? I think only that we are trending basically on plan. Thank you. Okay, no further questions on that. I just have one question on the insurance pool that you may or may not have an answer for. Um, good report, I guess. My only question is, uh, it's showing now, it states in the financial documents that there's a, uh, an unappropriated surplus of $2.7 million, of which there's just over a million dollars that is, um, it says the municipalities share, and I'm not certain if that's that I think that's probably across municipalities. But I've noted that in 2001, there was a dividend paid of a million dollars, and I'm wondering what the benchmark is or if we have an idea what the benchmark might be for unappropriated surpluses as it relates to future dividends or potential one. I can respond to that. Uh, and you are correct, that figure is Kitchener only. Okay. I think you were questioning whether that was across the whole pool. It's not. Uh, 
I'm not a fan of the use of the term surplus for this purpose. Um, essentially, we buy insurance, but under the limit of our insurance, we have a deductible that we manage within the pool, and then we have a local deductible. And so this is the only provision that we have to cover um, claims or losses that are not provided for within our current budget and current rates. So our actuaries do an analysis every three years, and they take a look at reserve sufficiency, and they, they advise us on what level of reserve, or in this case surplus, we should be maintaining um, to cover our claim liabilities and avoid retroactive assessments. So this is in addition to any investments, claims, reserves, or insurance coverage that we already have in place. They recommend a 95% confidence level. Uh, we're presently below a 90% confidence level, and that def difference is about $2 million. So the advice of our actuaries would be that we should actually be plowing an additional $2 million into that unappropriated surplus to have that 95% confidence level. We don't, but the board is satisfied that there is reasonable provision made within that balance. I think the, suffice it to say, uh, we're not looking at any dividend in the near future based on that analysis. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly then, you said an additional $2 million, including the million that's already in there, or $2 million total that they would, they would prefer, to, prefer to have? So I'll, I'll take you to the note just so that we're all on the same page. If you take a look at IF2-17. Okay. The table there, the column second from the right is the cumulative surplus as at May 31st. You can see our share is just over a million dollars. The total amount is 2.6. And our actuaries are advising us that that number should be roughly 4.7 to $5 million to achieve a 95% confidence level that we can cover all of our claims, liabilities, and avoid retroactive assessments. Okay. So based on that, the advisory board would not be recommending any sort of dividend in the near term. Very good, thank you. Uh, questions on this? Any question, count, questions on this, Councillor Gazzola? Along those lines, uh, uh, the first thing is, if I read correctly, our, our rates are gonna remain frozen for the coming year, is, is that correct? Or? Or was that, was that last year? I read something where there was just a minor change. That's correct. On, it's on IF2-4. Yeah. There's actually a modest reduction in our rates for, for this current for year. For 2014? 2014, 2015, yes. Uh, what, what's the fiscal year? Oh, it's, it's May, May 31st. Okay, so uh, do we know when we're dealing with the budget, are we going to be dealing with that or the, <laughs> the following period? I, I'll leave that to you. With the well, I, I, I see where you're going. And so all of this is handled through the insurance reserve. All of our insurance activity flows through the reserve. And our reserve either was in deficit or near a nil position recently. It's only starting to come back. And so uh, we need relief in that reserve, and this will provide a bit of a cushion to help start building that balance back up. The, the other question is just on the uh, statement of financial position. There are, there is the reserve for unpaid claims in that of 8.9 million. Are, are you saying that that, the, the actuaries feel that that's not adequate or? What they're saying is that um, they're advising us that we should have a 95% confidence level that the financial position of the pool can cover all of our claim liabilities between our investments, between those claim reserves which you've just referenced and the insurance coverage. And to achieve that 95% confidence level, we require an appropriated surplus in addition to that provision. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. I tried to get a dividend, Councillor Gazzola. It didn't work. Uh, Councillor gallery Seelock, on item number three. Yeah, on item number three, and I don't, uh, it's a not likely a question I'm assuming staff is going to know off the top of their head, but it's on page 3-31, um, uh, and it's with regards to LED street lighting standard and conversion. And really what I'm wondering is if we have a policy around um, the LED street light standards, um, and if we do, if that can come back, um, I think it's something that we need to review. We've uh, been given um, information from someone who's very knowledgeable uh, in the hazards of LED lights, and if they're too bright, um, that they can have significant causes to, uh, significant hazardous Causes. And I think it's something that we need to look at before we really start rolling out this whole program. It's a direction that we need to go, but if my understanding is correct, um, the light pollution that it gives off, um, and if we look at a standard that is anything more than uh, between 2,200 and 3,000 Kelvins, that um, it's going to create some hazardous 
um, situations um, for um, our community um, and the health of our community. So it's just something that I want to um, make sure that we are able to look at and address. So if it's from a policy standard, I do still think it's the way to go, but we just need to make sure we're putting in the right system. So if we can uh, maybe just get some information on that uh, and what if we have a policy, if we don't, um, what, what we can do to uh, generate one of those. Very good. Thanks. And finishing off with Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. So my questions are on um, on the business plan, and I, I believe that this has been asked before. But an understanding of how some of these uh, projects and initiatives, what the costs are, and the implications of some of those costs. Uh, I, sometimes I'm looking at all these different um, campaigns and reviews and. Um, operating standard review, when I look through them I'm thinking, well, first of all, I have a, I'm having a really hard time understanding some of the wording, so I don't know whether that there's a, maybe a dummy down version that I could understand better. Um, certainly if anybody was to look at this, uh, I think it looks like all Greek just to me sometimes. Um, but just a, an understanding of what some of these, these costs can be how they're tied into the budget. I, I understand that these initiatives are tied into the budget, but I, I sometimes think it would be good to have some idea of what the dollar figure, figure is. My other question is, um, is related to um, the concern about on um, um, IF3-15, the development of the business case for the expansion of the Dune Pioneer Park Community Center. My understanding was that it was 2016 is when we would be actually moving into the expansion. Now I'm seeing 2017. Have I missed something? Have we moved it out another year? Pardon me, Mr. May. Through you, Mr. Chair, I can uh, go back and confirm this, but my understanding is uh, that the information in this report mirrors that of the DC review, which did adjust capital funding over the 10-year forecast. Okay, so now we're looking at 2017 as the year it's completed or shovels go in the ground? Mr. May? Through you, Mr. Chair, I can provide you with the latest timeline uh, within a few hours, so I'll get that information for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, think I thought I had another question on one of these items. And since there's nobody else ahead of me, I'll take an extra minute. Um, When I look at our, on page 24 and 25, talking about the Pink Street phase launch, uh, when will we, we get an update on how this is working and are we getting the information and how is that translating into work orders? Um, and our open data portal launch and data set. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm still, and maybe I just need to have a one-on-one -on -one with, with staff about this, trying to understand what kind of data we're going to actually be offering to the public <clears throat> and how that's going to help them. So that may actually be maybe a request for a meeting in, in the near future with a staff person. Um, when I look at the implementation of the mobile strategy, I, I, I just, I, again, I'm really having, really struggling to understand where we're going with this. I, I know that it means that Staff have mobile devices in, in their vehicles so that they can um, tr fast track on, on work orders and make sure, and, and correct me if I'm wrong again, uh, so that we can leverage the fact that more work is getting done and how the timely time that it's getting done. So if that's what we're doing with this, I want to have a sense of how is that working. Mr. Chapman? Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to set up a meeting to talk about open data. Uh, as you know, we've released a major group of data sets, and I believe another release is happening even maybe this week, so it's timely that we could meet and review those. In terms of mobile technology, you're right. In terms of the types of projects where mobile technology is being deployed, um, it's to allow people to access mapping in the field, for example, as opposed to returning to the office or to process work orders in the field. Uh, we had committed when Council gave approval last year through budget to come back annually with a progress update, and so in the fairly near future with the new council, we'll come back and provide more information on what's happened over the past year. Okay. 
And one other question I have, as I was flipping through the pages, is the, um, on, the, on the bottom of page 25, the business continuity plan implementation. Um, it talks about key planned events, carry out two sets of interviews with the most urgent business processes to finalize the maximum tolerable period of disruption and identify risks. I'm sorry, I don't understand what the heck that means. And I don't think I'm stupid, but it really, it, it, some of the wording is just, it's just not plain English. And I think as council, if we're going to approve business plans, we need to really understand exactly what this means that we're doing. And, and I haven't, haven't got a clue. So I don't feel comfortable uh, approving a plan that I don't have a clue about what some of the things that we're doing. So okay. um, we're not we're not approving this though. Right? It's just I know it's an information yeah. item, and but but it you know it's tied to our budget. Yeah. And um, well, I think part of the reason this well, I guess the only reason this really comes to is if there are questions, um, this is really a good opportunity to to go through and connect with staff offline to, if you have any specific concerns or questions about any specific item, and then we deal with that when we actually approve the business plan. Okay. And I think staff would obviously be open to that as well. Well, I think that those are, I do have a number of questions, and I think what I'll do is I will meet with Mr. Chapman, and any further questions, I will um, deal with staff on it. Thanks. And Councillor Singh has a question. Yeah, and as you have said, Mr. Chair, that it is appropriate to you know, go into detail with staff offline. Just want a uh, quick reference to this, the uh, Wi-Fi rollout phase two sites, uh, and I know that uh, it's extension of reach of free Wi-Fi in public spaces. Uh, this is something I've talked with staff individually in the past, and I think I may have made comments publicly as well. Are we considering our uh, local, you know, our district parks, outside spaces as well? Any consideration being given to that? I believe this would be new information from my understanding of the Wi-Fi strategy, but I will look to staff to see if there's any, any difference. Mr. Chapman. Through the chair, I believe the focus right now is on completing the, the secondary list of sites, which I don't recall included outdoor spaces yep, that's all for the most part. Know. But as you know, we're looking at a number of the arenas to bring them on stream next, and so work is happening there. Uh, you will know in the business plan, though, that we're looking to refresh the technology strategy in 2015, and I have no doubt that Wi-Fi um, will be an issue of interest, and so something we'll look at where we go beyond phase two. Great, thank you. Okay, no further questions. Thank you, everyone. This uh, meeting is convened. Mayor Zare. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. We'll call the special council meeting to order. I'll just stay in this position uh, here so you don't have to change it in the clerk's table. The first item is to deal with the item coming forward related to the de delegated authority of Big Music Fest, moved by Councillor Davey, seconded by Councillor Ioannidis. Those in favour? Yes, we can. And uh, I think, if my memory serves me correctly, even though it was in just two hours ago, there was just the one motion that was uh, that was uh, successful. So, well, actually, just the report coming back after. Yeah, it was the that was amended though. So there's a recorded vote has been called for. You can now vote. Those in favor. It'll be faster on the draw. Do we all have to do it again? Diane? We all have to do it again. Okay, those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, next is the uh, motion to go into camera, moved by Councillor galloway Seelock, second by Councillor Singh. Those in favour? Opposed? That's carried. Bylaw for three readings, moved by Councillor uh, Verbanovich, second by Councillor uh, Ioannidis. Those in favour? Opposed? That is carried. And this meeting is adjourned.